Yo, yo, what's up everyone? In this video, we are gonna be talking about floating point data types in C++, float and double. Speaking of double, you know a great way to double your C++ productivity and experience? Check out our sponsor, Embarcadero C++ Builder. This is an IDE that's going to speed up your development process because they have awesome great tools like a drag and drop UI development system. This is really going to help you build applications because it comes with a lot of tools needed to speed up the process. So for example, if you're struggling with debugging, C++ Builder has a great debugging system. If you need to work with a database, C++ Builder has your back. And if you want drag and drop easy to use components for your applications, then phew, yeah, obviously C++ Builder has got you there too. With this IDE, you can build your applications for iOS, Android, Mac, and Windows and it allows you to preview your applications on all of these different platforms. So the UI development is responsive for these different device sizes. Overall, it's a pretty feature intensive IDE. It's gonna give you what you need to get the job done. So check it out, link in the description. Now let's get back to floating point numbers. I'm gonna say upfront, that I am no expert on this topic. This is Caleb's version of how floating point numbers work. <laughs> I'm sure if you want a really detailed description of the internals, how they're stored, you could find some really, really intense document online. Maybe read it at night when you can't sleep, it'll help you out. <laughs> but I'm gonna give you what you need to know to use floating point numbers. So yeah, that is your upfront disclosure. So what the heck is a floating point number? Well, there are three types of floating point numbers. We have float, we have double, and then we have long double. Now these all work similar in nature when it comes to storage, so let's just talk about that. When we're working with floating point numbers, we're going to have basically two sections. We're going to have a number such as 7.7, .7, and this is going to be multiplied by some giant number such as 10,000. So when you evaluate this, this is going to be 77,000. But by breaking a number up into the left part where we have the significant digits and then some multiplier, we're able to store much larger numbers with a limited amount of memory. The consequence though is that floating point numbers are only trustworthy to a certain number of significant digits. So floating point numbers, they can become huge, but they're only so trustworthy. And you'll see what I mean here soon. So when we are writing out a double, like let's say we wanted to assign a value to one of these variables, we can just put the value like so. But another way to represent this is actually 7.7e4. .7 Basically scientific notation, something you may or may not have learned in school. Probably not. <laughs> so you can also think of this as 7.7 .7 times 10 raised to the fourth power. You can actually assign a value to a double using this format. So if we wanted to put 77,000, we could just put 7.7e4. .7 and then what we could do is we could see out this and you'll see what I mean. Oh, shoot, I totally forgot to give this a variable name, see. <laughs> All right, when we run this, we get 77,000. So that might help you understand a little bit more about how floating point numbers are stored. They're stored with significant digits and then some multiplier, 10 to the fourth power in this case. This is actually where it gets the name floating point. It's because you have a decimal point and you float that to the left or to the right. This here is basically saying move that decimal to the right four places. So if you think of having 7.7 .7, and then you just basically take that decimal, move it over once to the right, you're gonna have 77 period, and then move it over again, you're gonna have this and then this and then this. It's kind of hard to see on a computer, but basically think of it like this. If you have 77,000, you start with a period right here, move it over four times and you get 77,000. So that's where the floating point comes from. All right, so now let's talk about the differences between float, double, and long double. Well, float is the least trustworthy of them all. It has the least number of significant digits that we can trust. So let's go through an example that shows this. Let's get rid of all that junk there. What we're gonna do is we're gonna assign to this 10 divided by three. And you need to put 0 0.0 on at least one of these so it doesn't use integer division. What I'm gonna do here is see out A and see what we get. So we get 3.3333, awesome. And now what I wanna do is I wanna take this number and multiply it by another really big number. So we're gonna take A equals A times, and then we'll just put a really big number right here. Now when we output it, let's see what we get. Well, we actually get this in scientific notation, which I don't particularly want, so we're gonna change that. If you go to this C out and add standard colon colon fixed, that's going to fix our problem. 
see because it says fixed. <laughs> I'm kidding. Oh, you also have to put arrows, duh. All right, so make sure you have those arrows there. And you can see we get this really crazy number right here. I'm also going to put an end line here. All right, so this is the number. You can see at some point it no longer says three. It starts going 188608, like what is going on there? Well, that is what I'm trying to explain to you guys, that floats are not entirely trustworthy. Doubles are a little bit more trustworthy when we get to a lot of significant digits, but still it has its limitations. So how many significant digits can we trust for each one of these? Well, the way we figure that out is go to the top and include another file, and this is going to be float.h. This file is going to make available to us some constants that we can get values from that say how many significant digits a particular data type is trustworthy to. So let's go through an example. Let's do another C out here. And the first one we're going to do is float underscore dig for digits. When we run this, we get six. So what that is saying is that we can trust this to six digits. One, two, three, four, five, six. You can see the seventh actually got the right value, but that's not really a guarantee. We can only trust it to six. It just so happens that it got the right value in this case. Let's try it again, but instead of float, let's try double. You can see that the double actually allows 15 trustworthy digits. So that means if we change this to a double here, we should get a little bit more of a precise result. And you can see we got a lot more threes, so that is much better. You can see we actually got 16 threes, so it's much more precise. Lastly, let's try this with long double, and you can see we get 18. So you can see as you go from what was float to double to long double, we get more precision and the number becomes more trustworthy when it comes to significant digits and what is actually correct. I recommend going with at least double. I don't see a reason to ever use float unless you're really restricted on memory. Doubles can hold huge values, so this is going to meet most of your needs. But if you're working with something that has to be exactly precise, these data types might not do the trick. If that's the case, such as if you're working with money, you are going to want to look up how to do exact precision in C++. So there are libraries you can import that allow you to use a data type that you can trust every number in that number. So if you're in the scenario where you need numbers after a decimal, but you need them to be 100% trustworthy, then make sure you find the appropriate tool to do that. Don't use double or float. You're asking for trouble. Most of the scenarios I'm gonna be using, float and double will do just fine because the up to 18 digits of significant digits is more than enough for me. Before we go, I did wanna give you an extra tip. And that is, when would you want to use a floating point number over an integer? Well, obviously, if you need a fractional part of a number, you need to use one of the floating point types. But oftentimes, you can use integers instead of floating point numbers to represent something that would normally require a fractional part. So, like, let's say you're in the situation where you're working with money, and you might have cents, which is a fraction of a dollar. Well, instead of using a floating point number and having fractional parts, what you could do is just have an integer and have it called cents. So rather than having $1, you could just have 100 cents. So if you keep everything in cents and you don't have fractional pennies, then you basically mitigate the problem of an untrustworthy data type. And if you're working with a lot of money, then you could definitely use a larger data type than int. So that's my first tip. The only other tip I have is that you should generally use double. So the only reason to use float is mainly memory. Or should I say, main memory. <laughs> That's all I got for you guys. In the next video, we're gonna be talking about constants in C++. It's a pretty good topic to know about, so check it out. There's lots of things you can do for constants and it's a little bit more complicated than you might expect. So I'm gonna try to break it down for you.